great. Uh, welcome to um, South Asia's uh, lecture series at uh, Oslo Metropolitan University, Oslo in Norway. Uh, the lecture series is called the Imagining the Environment. Uh, it is part of a longer thought process that has gone into making a space um, um, for a young scholar combined with scholars uh, in the area of environmental studies who have produced distinguished scholarship. Um, Imagining the environment is um, in the series of um, another early spring uh, perceptions of environment uh, seminar series that we have ran in which we have a number of uh, early careers uh, graduates who have spoken on a range of environmental histories and politics in India. Uh, this is a lecture series which draws on and bear on some of the commitments we've had uh, within our project. Um, I'm Rahul Ranjan. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the Department of International Studies here at Oslo Metropolitan University. And I work for a project called Riverine Rights that looks at the question of legal personhood uh, in three different cases, uh, including India, New Zealand, um, as well as uh, Colombia. And within the project, I have my own proposal that looks at uh, the life of law um, through, um, through some of the key component of grief, memory, and affect. Um, I'm very delighted um, that today uh, Professor Sunil Amrit is here with us. And I must note before I introduce him to the panel that um, he was very kind to have accepted my request to speak uh, on a very short notice, and he's been very kind uh, in communicating uh, with me. So Professor Sunil Amrit uh, is a Renu Dhawan Professor of History at the Department of History at Yale University. He's also the Chair of South Asian Studies Council, where he will resume his tenure in fall 2022. His research focuses on the movements of people, ecological processes that have connected South and Southeast Asia. Amrit's area of interest uh, include environmental history, history of migration, and the history of public health. He's a 2017 MacArthur Fellow and recipient of 2016 InfoSys Prize in Humanities. Amrit's most recent book, Unruly Water, um, is, a, is a book on history of struggles to understand and control the monsoons in modern South Asia, which is also a book which is almost magisterial for our own project uh, and projects on riverine rights within India. His previous book includes Crossing the Bengal, Bay of Bengal, The Furies of Nature and Fortunes of Migrant, published by Harvard University Press in 2013. He's also the author of Migration and Diaspora in Modern South, Modern Asia, published by Cambridge University Press in 2011, and Decolonizing International Health, South and Southeast Asia, 1930-1965, Palgrave, 2006. Before joining Yale, Amrit was an inaugural Mehra family professor of South Asian history at Harvard University from 2015 to 2020, where he also served as the co-director of Joint Center for History and Economics. Uh, from 20, 2006 to 2015, before he had left for US, he taught at Birkbeck College at the University of London. Uh, Sunil grew up in, in Singapore and has received his undergraduate and graduate degree at the University of Cambridge. Um, so we are very delighted that today he's here to speak on his new research. And we very much look forward to listening to you, uh, Sunil. You have about 45 to 50 minutes to speak, and then we would open the floor for questions. So there are two ways people can ask questions. One way is to write down your question into the chat box. Uh, and since Sunil is the co-host, um, we will both have the access to the question and I will have it read anyway for all of you at the end. And the other way is to just use the emoji sign to raise your hand and I'll have you unmuted. Um, Sunil, welcome. Thank you, Rahul. Thank you so much for this invitation. Thank you all for coming. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here. I'm just gonna share my screen for a second. Um, okay, great. Um, so imagining the environment is actually a really good title <laughs> for what I'm about to talk about, because in, in many ways, this is a talk about imagination as much as anything else. It's about a political imagination of water. 
um, very happy to see um, friends and colleagues in the audience. One or two of you may have heard uh, me talk about some of these ideas before, for which I uh, apologize. Uh, hopefully there are a couple of new things also mixed in with that. So in February this year, um, an avalanche led to a massive landslide in the Indian state of uh, Uttarakhand, causing extensive damage to two uh, dam sites. Most of you will have seen um, that, that news and, and the horrific images that came from that. Uh, most of those injured or killed in the disaster were construction workers, uh, many of them migrants. There are two things I'd like to pinpoint about this latest disaster. The first is that it was utterly predictable. Not the specific uh, landslide, of course, but the risk. Just two years earlier, a uh, villager from Chamoli, the local area, had filed a writ petition with the court pointing out the massive environmental risks of construction. Uh, repeated judgments by uh, various levels of the legal apparatus right up to the Supreme Court uh, tried to stop construction in the broader region. And these judgments were mostly disregarded. The second thing I'd like to pinpoint is the reaction to this disaster by the chief minister of the state. One of the first things the chief minister said was that this tragedy, this disaster, should not lead people to adopt an anti-development narrative. It's one of the very first reactions to this um, after the immediate relief operations was this idea, this fear that this would lead people to question the project or to, in those words, adopt an anti-development narrative. And the basic question that I have in my talk is a question which many others have asked and have been asking for 20 or 30 years including my, my Yale colleague, Jim Scott, and, and many others, which is why does this keep happening? There has been mass political mobilization against large dams in India uh, for about 40 years. Um, there have been studies by scientists and environmentalists for 40 years or more uh, pointing to these risks. Um, and yet we're still in this place where it is seen as anti-development to question the juggernaut. So that is the basic question. And my answer to that question is I do think we need a long historical perspective. I think the longer history helps us to explain two things. One is the enduring symbolic value of dams, so that to give up on the construction of big dams is an admission of failure, it's the admission of the failure of a project to which a very large numbers of people continue to be committed. Um, and the second, uh, more material, is, is that the long historical perspective uh, gives us a sense of, of some of the vested interests, the so-called dam industry, that are quite committed to the continuation of uh, these infrastructure projects, despite the mounting, escalating, cascading risks. Some of this draws on, on my recent book, uh, Unruly Waters, um, but I also want to point to the ways in which it's really um, inspired and influenced by the work of many colleagues in the field. And, and just to name a very few, um, Ajyoti Saikya's work on the Brahmaputra uh, gives a really long durée perspective on the river, uh, touches on many of these issues. Um, if the Karak Bal is really a pioneer thinking about the environmental history, in this case of the Bengal Delta, um, Rohan D'Souza was one of the first to write about dams um, the Adjani Bhattacharya's wonderful work uh, brings legal history into conversation with environmental history. Um, then more recently, Liz Chatterjee's work on, on energy has, has been really inspiring to me to think through some of the um, later 20th century implications of, of this story. So I just want to flag that I mean, what I say is, is really also very much informed by and inspired by the work of, of a whole group of environmental historians, legal historians, historians of uh, water in South Asia. I also want to say that my uh, path to thinking about rivers in India was perhaps an unusual one in that I came first from uh, studying the ocean, uh, from studying the sea. So my, my earlier work was on the Bay of Bengal as a space of migration, as a space of environmental transformation. And it was really towards the end of that earlier project um, 
that I realized again in conversation with many others, including Iftikhar Iqbal, who, who um, in a very memorable phrase at one point in a talk that he gave, he said, well, the Brahmaputra is an arm of the Bay of Bengal. Um, and really in, in many conversations, it became clear to me that thinking about that uh, maritime space without thinking about the rivers was, was really to miss something. Um, and in my work, um, there are many other ways to think about that relationship. But in my work, the link was actually climate. The link was the monsoon. The link was, was the history of monsoon science and climate science in India. Um, and, and that remains at the core of what I'm going to talk to you about today, um, which is really that relationship between uh, the monsoon, uh, ideas about the monsoon, uh, imaginations of the monsoon, um, and the particular techno trajectory of, of trying to engineer water and rivers in particular in the ways that we are still very much um, living with. So let me begin uh, with a very well-worn cliche. Uh, we, we still see this quoted in the Indian newspapers almost every year as the monsoon approaches, which is this 1909 uh, statement by the finance minister and the imperial government that every budget is a gamble on the rains. There's some question about exactly when and how that was said. I've actually never seen the original source. I've seen this uh, referred to in, in many uh, different capacities right back from the 1900s and 1910s, but nevertheless, it may be apocryphal, but it has stuck. More than half a century later, that same sentiment still held. For us in India, scarcity, is but a mist monsoon away, Indira Gandhi said in 1966. And then just a couple of years ago, Sunita Narayan, one of India's most influential environmentalists, declared India's finance minister is the monsoon. Um, she said this in a talk she gave at Harvard in 2017. I've, I've also seen her tweet a similar things since then. At one level, of course, this is to state a simple basic truth. Even today, 60% of India's agriculture remains rain-fed, uh, subject to a monsoon climate that has always been subject to intense seasonality and a good deal of variability. But the story that I want to tell is not the classic story of, of climate as destiny, a story that many versions of which were, were prevalent in the first part of the 20th century. It's somewhat the opposite. It's how the idea that the monsoon was India's destiny has had very significant political implications. That indeed, um, escaping that destiny, changing that destiny, uh, became one of the most enduring political projects, I think, in modern India and indeed in South Asia, looking beyond uh, the nation state of India um, in the 20th century. There's a much longer history to this. There's a 19th century history to this, um, which I, I won't go into in detail now, but we can come back to that in, in the Q&A if, if people would like to talk more about uh, the precedents. I'll, I'll start um, the early 20th century in what I think is an important turning point. Um, and that comes with the Indian Industrial Commission of the late 19 teens, a committee of government officials, industrialists, both British and Indian, looking towards an industrial future. The First World War, of course, had in many ways stimulated industrialization in India because for the first time um, there was a degree of, of tariff protection and autonomy for Indian industrialization, which Indian industrialists have, of course, always been denied by the British until those circumstances. One of the most interesting um, conclusions of the Industrial Commission was this idea um, quoted here that the terrible calamities which from time to time depopulated wide stretches of the country need no longer be feared. This is only 20 or 30 years after the uh, last of the catastrophic late 19th century famines of the 1890s, even into the 1900s. Uh, already in 1918, Confidently, um, there is this projection that this is not going to happen anymore. In a monsoon climate, they concluded failures of the rains must always mean privation and hardship, but not wholesale starvation and loss of life. 
And this conveyed a very strong sense, also shared by demographers who were writing at the time, uh, that something fundamental had changed in the first two decades of the 20th century. The idea that the risk posed by climate had been mitigated in part by policy, the early warning systems of the famine codes, but perhaps much more than that by technology, by irrigation. As long as India remained primar primarily agrarian, at some level of risk would remain, but the commissioners, the industrial commissioners, uh, envisaged a future in which industrialization would provide new employment and greater security as India's population moved from the countryside uh, to the cities. To put it baldly, they believed by the 1920s that India had conquered famine. And yet the worry about water and climate did not go away. We can see this deep anxiety about the material conditions of life in the way that even many anti-colonial leaders, leaders in the nationalist movement thought about freedom. Uh, because for all of them, water was crucial. Nehru wrote in 1929 that modern science claims to have curbed to a large extent the tyranny and vagaries of nature. That's a phrase I keep coming back to. Science has tamed the tyranny and vagaries of nature. But immediately he went on to recognize that there was a large gap between that promise and reality. And he was clear in this case, um, late 1920s, Nehru was clear about the material urgency underpinning freedom. Our desire for freedom, he told his fellow elite nationalists, our desire for freedom is a thing more of the mind than the body. But most Indians, he continued, suffer hunger and deepest poverty, an empty stomach and a bare back. For these masses, freedom is a vital bodily necessity. And I'll come back to that idea when I think about 1940s and the whole um, embrace, even obsession, with large infrastructure. Mahatma Gandhi made a, a different connection between nature and freedom. We can see this, uh, for example, during the Salt Satyagraha, um, where choosing the salt tax is the symbolic focus of his protest. He observed that next to air and water, salt is the greatest necessity of life. The vital properties of salt linked the coastal ecosystem with the lives of millions in land. His was also an argument about climate and society, argued that the poorest who labored outdoors in the heat were most in need of salt. It's a very wide range of Indian thinkers and scientists and activists were starting to draw different conclusions from this recognition that uh, whatever the promise of scientific technology, that there was this um, underlying anxiety that would inhibit every one of their projects if it were not addressed. We can see this in the divergence of opinion uh, between uh, the Bengali sociologist and economist Aradha Kamal Mukherjee um, and the scientist Meghnad Saha, both of whom were writing about Bengal's rivers in the 1930s. Both saw the pronounced seasonality of a monsoon climate as integral to the nature of the problem, but they had very different solutions. Uh, so Mukherjee believed in the restoration of what he already in the 1930s was calling ecological balance. He believed that respect for the distinctive nature of each riverine ecosystem would provide the seeds of both economic and environmental revival. Saha's prescription was the polar opposite. He was scathing in response to Mukherjee and others who had argued that uh, planting trees and reducing local deforestation would strip the Damodar River of its destructive power. He called, uh, this is Saha, called the claim that rainfall affected, uh, deforestation affected rainfall, a very common claim by the so-called desiccationists of the 19th century. He called that claim absurd. That was his word. A claim for which he continued, there is not a single iota of positive proof. If changes in forest cover and land use had any effect on local climate, Saha wrote, they must be extremely small compared to the huge monsoon currents which are responsible for the precipitation on the Damodar Valley. 
Um, interestingly enough, that pendulum has swung again, and I'll talk at the end of my talk about uh, recent research, which suggests actually land use change uh, may well be having an impact on the monsoon. But here is a debate uh, between, if you like, a localist prescription for uh, local ecological regeneration um, and a much more top-down technocratic prescription. Um, and this is Saha's idea that rainfall is beyond any kind of human intervention, but human intervention to transform the landscape could neutralize the threat posed by the uncertainty of river flow and rainfall, securing rivers from the alternation of uh, scarcity and excess. And here Saha was very confident about the future. We're fortunate to live at a time when the large scale experience of thousands of dams constructed in the USA since 1915 are at our disposal, he wrote. He believed that the global circulation of ideas and technology, a process of learning, would come to India's aid. In valorizing the American and Soviet models, uh, there was also a critique of, of British colonialism. He was arguing that those transformative visions went much further than anything that the sluggish British colonial state could ever carry out. And the scale of time, as well as the scale of a technology, is something striking here. He envisaged the construction of dams in eastern India that would last for, quote, hundreds of years. That is perhaps one of the, the, the key ways in which the sort of imaginary of the 1930s and 1940s uh, went very badly wrong um, in the second half of the 20th century. This idea that these dams were forever. Let me pause here before I proceed to talk about how these multiple strands of thought uh, influenced uh, the engineering of rivers in India after independence. Uh, my invocation of Saha has brought us to the topic that I think more than anything else has uh, dominated uh, the historiography of water in India, and that is the question of large dams. Um, they've undoubtedly been of pivotal importance, as I'll discuss in a minute. Uh, but I think it's also a mistake to search or to scour the archives of the early 20th century only for the roots of India's enthusiasm for large dams. I think what we see is a multiplicity of ways of thinking about the monsoon. And these were at once more local and in a sense more global uh, than the exclusive focus on large dams um, in the way we think about this history might lead us to um, conclude. So going back to Nehru's uh, statement about freedom being this vital bodily necessity, political theorist Rude Mehta um, argued that what he calls the immediate ambit of political power in post-colonial India was dictated by the intensity of mere life. Mehta argued that poverty and destitution put most Indians under the pressing dictates of their bodies. There's a real echo there of what Nehru is saying. And that the imperative to address these basic needs, Mehta observed, can have no limiting bounds. This simple logic, I'm quoting from Mehta, transforms power from a traditional concern with freedom to a concern with life and its necessities. And in this quest, what I'd like to add to that is, is the idea that the control of water is absolutely central, perhaps more central than anything else. And to go back to the question I began my talk with, you know, why does this keep happening? I think the answer is definitely there somewhere. This idea that, um, you know, that Mehta says that this, this can have no limiting bounds because that's uh, so pressing and so urgent at that pivotal moment in 1930s and 40s. There's no question then that large dams did come to symbolize progress and freedom in post-independence India. And this is a very familiar uh, point. This was the era when in Sunil Kilnani's memorable phrase, India fell in love uh, with concrete. Nehru's, again, often quoted reflection that these were the temples of new India is, is cited all the time. Dreams of hydraulic engineering were inseparable from the project of freedom. Kanwar Sen, the head, uh, second head of India's Water Authority, wrote that the river valley projects constitute the single biggest effort since independence to meet the material wants of the people. 
For from irrigation, he continued, springs ultimately the sinews of man, from power, the sinews of industry. He voiced the hopes of many of India's planners and architects when he declared that the dams are indeed the symbols of the aspirations of new India. And then he changes register and the blessings that stream forth from them are the enduring gifts of this generation to posterity. Again, these dams are forever in this particular imagination. So note the fusion of the language of science and faith, uh, reason and rapture. One aspect of this story has been very well studied, and that is the, of course, the influence of American hydraulic experts in the Cold War context, like David Lilienthal, particularly on the Damodar Valley Corporation. Um, Daniel Klingensmith wrote a very important book on this in the late 1990s, and uh, my friend and colleague here, David Engerman, has written a great book um, a few years ago, The Price of Aid, a really detailed look at India and the economic Cold War, and then you know, Damodar Valley uh, aid is, is a small part of that. Um, and this gives you a sense of the sort of symbolism that I was talking about. Um, a lot of this will be familiar. Um, Nehru at the opening of the Bakra Dam and this from a publicity, a film showing the sort of monumental scale of this technology, very much wedded to a nation building project. If you look at some of the publicity films made by the films division in the 1950s, um, so much of this is about a kind of the making of a new kind of worker, of a new kind of citizen, uh, an emphasis on the linguistic and regional diversity of the workforce, for example, as well as, as, as the rapture of the technology itself and what it meant for the control of nature. If you just look at this particular image, you, you can see um, you can see it all there. You can see uh, the threatening rain clouds, you can see the scale of the technology, you can see uh, the electric illumination, uh, and you can see how uh, so, so symbolic a picture like this is of so many of the projects in the 1950s. And we can talk in a minute, of course, about what's invisible in this picture, which is the, the massive displacement um, and, and the inequality that these kinds of projects um, really deepen. But I want to make the point before getting to that, that the Americans were not the only influences. The, the Americans and the Soviets were not the only influences on this. And that in turn, um, India shaped approaches to uh, water management, to river engineering uh, in Southeast Asia as well. So I'd like to think about both of those things very briefly now, uh, just to make the point that this is a trans-regional, um, in some sense, a uh, global project. So in May 1954, Kanwar Sen, who I, I quoted earlier, um, chairman of India's Central Water Commission, and K.L. Rao, another influential water engineer, uh, went on an official mission to China. They went to inspect and report back on China's water projects and on flood control in particular. Um, and strikingly, they were amongst the first outsiders from anywhere to see the scale of China's water engineering projects, which in the Maoist era were actually probably the only place which is on a far greater scale than what India was trying to achieve. They arrived in May 1954 and they stayed for two months. They actually spent a lot of their time on the Yangtze River. They traveled by boat. Um, their report, interestingly, contains an extended list of every single Chinese official they met, from ministers to field engineers to water scientists at the College of Hydraulic Engineering for Eastern China in Nanjing. They were struck by the quality of China's hydraulic engineers. They praised the Chinese capacity for improvisation, building huge dams from local materials when imports were in short supply. And naturally, the entire report is in the form of a, a comparison. Everything they observed in China, they made a comparative reflection on India. And one sharp contrast that they made was again, climatic. Once again, what made India distinctive was the monsoon. Unlike India, hemmed in by the Himalayas, they wrote, China is open to Central Asia. And this meant that in the summer, China, unlike India, is not the single objective of the air circulation of a whole ocean. So there again, this idea, this imagination of the monsoon is shaping how they think about rivers and the potential uh, to engineer them. By contrast, they argued that China's rivers were more, rivers themselves were more menacing than India's more prone to burst their banks. And so they made a simple contrast. India's great need is irrigation, China's was flood control. What they share 
is a concern with energy, with electricity generation and hydropower. So India's most prominent water engineers returned from China with a sense that the two countries shared fundamental problems, that there were lessons they could learn from China. But there were ominous portents as well. In his final speech bidding Sen and Rao farewell, the Chinese director of water resources had described how China's water projects had been extended, quote, to the border regions of our fraternal minorities, and they have helped to promote national unity. There was never an attempt on the Chinese side to disguise the fact that water was intrinsic to political power. Uh, the conquest of water meant the conquest of space. Um, Unspoken, of course, was the idea that sometimes these border regions in question may include the borders between India um, and China. Sen and Ra Rao faced a further problem when they got back to India with the first ever maps of China's water projects. The Ministry of uh, Indian Ministry of External Affairs immediately withdrew their report from circulation because the maps that Sen and Rao had of China's water projects showed the borders in the wrong place. This was very embarrassing for them. And indeed, their report became a classified document for, for several years, uh, particularly after 1962. And I think that's quite telling. This is one of, of several moments where water becomes a, a geopolitical issue um, in Asia, um, something we can talk about perhaps more in, in, in the Q&A. Just as China's experiences inspired India's engineers, so India in some sense became a source of expertise uh, for other parts of Southeast Asia. In the mid 1950s, the UN uh, Commission, Economic Commission for Asia and the Far East um, commissioned again, Kanwar Sen, who's a very influential figure in this whole period, uh, to join a UN mission to survey the Mekong River. The prick has gone too deep to be halted. This is how Sen himself described the sense that large scale hydraulic engineering was now inevitable. The prick has gone too deep to be halted. That tells us too how important the kind of ideology and the symbolism of this is. This is now unstoppable. This goes beyond cost benefit analysis. The prick has gone too deep to be halted. The Mekong Commission, of course, as, as you all know, was very quickly overshadowed by the escalation of US involvement in Indochina as the US became mired in military conflict in Vietnam that engulfed Vietnam's neighbors as well. And there's always a close relationship between American Cold War strategy and support for dam building, not only in Indochina, but also in Thailand. There's been some, some good work on that by Cold War historians. But for me, the interesting thing is that despite that, Sen continued. He was a patriotic Indian engineer at the pinnacle of his profession. He was enamored of China. He also had close personal and professional links with the US Bureau of Reclamation. And he chose to spend a decade with the uh, Mekong Commission, trying to coordinate the development of Asia's most transboundary river, notwithstanding the power politics uh, that continued to sort of uh, disrupt and indeed make, make nonsense of the scheme uh, as it was initially envisaged. In his memoirs, he hints that part of this was the material reward of working for the UN, but that his motivations went deeper. He believed, like so many of his generation, that taming the waters was a goal that transcended politics, transcended ideology. In his memoir, which is very detached in its tone, it's a very clinical memoir, in a sense, not that interesting as a piece of writing, there's this rare moment of emotion which suddenly sort of erupts into the text when he describes what he calls his pilgrimage to Angkor Wat. This is in the late 1950s, early 1960s. I was very much moved, he wrote, by the ancient glory and culture of India reflected in Angkor. Just as many of India's water engineers presented their new temples, their dams are standing within an ancient historical tradition of water engineering, Sen appealed to this deep history of cultural exchange and older echo of the idea of greater India uh, to provide ballast for his vision of Asia united by water engineers. So by the mid 1960s, uh, this whole approach to water had run into major difficulties. Drought of 1965, uh, 66, uh, the declaration of famine in Bihar, the first such declaration in India after independence was seen as, as a humiliation 
uh, by the Indian government. This is after Nehru's death in a period of, of political transition. How helplessly we are at the mercy of the elements. This was the headline, the Times of India, 1965, arguing that all India had to show for the previous decade of development efforts was some shallow and tentative improvements in irrigation. The crux of the Indian response to this was, of course, uh, what we now think of as the Green Revolution. From the 19th century, India's geography of water had shaped plans for the country's future. Uh, now the difference between irrigated and rain-fed areas would be accepted as a sort of necessary inequality and a concentration of uh, inputs in the language of the time uh, would cluster on already irrigated and prosperous areas, uh, combined of course with high yielding varieties that had first been tried in Mexico and the Philippines. Precondition for the growth of the Green Revolution in India, of course, was the massive expansion in irrigation. That water did not come from dams, of course, it came from groundwater. Um, this gives you a sense. Uh, this shows uh, the expansion of Indian irrigated area. See how sharply that uh, turns up in the late 1960s. That is all groundwater. So one of the paradoxes that I've been trying to think through is the sense that from fairly early on, from the late 60s, uh, dams are no longer very significant to irrigation in India. And yet they continue. Uh, the 1970s are, are probably the, the peak era of dam, large dam construction um, in India. So despite the declining importance um, of dams in irrigation, uh, their profusion continued with escalating costs. The range of estimates for the number of people displaced by dam projects in India uh, ranges from 16 to 40 million people since 1947. Those estimates were made about a decade ago. I suspect they're even higher now. Adivasis have at every point been the worst affected, least likely to be compensated for losses of land, and livelihood, to say nothing of the kinds of loss that, that couldn't be compensated, losses of community, of landscape, of um, environment. The ecological consequences of large dams have also been concentrated in the areas of the dam's uh, construction. Reservoirs have drowned millions of hectares of forest. Canals and barrages have disrupted water flow and drainage, often accompanied by a rise in vector-borne uh, diseases. There was nothing inevitable about this outcome. I, I think we need at least to understand um, that even now um, these trajectories can be changed. Um, it, it's helpful to go back to the critiques, even those that weren't heeded. It's useful to go back to the archive um, for the warnings and, and to understand at the very least why they haven't been heeded. Um, so in the 1970s, uh, the same era when groundwater displaces dams in the irrigation story, but which is also the peak era of dam construction. It's, it's also the era when um, a rising environmental consciousness in India at every level from the, the highest levels of government to the rise of, of, of massive civil society groups. These all coincide in the 1970s. I and mean, this is something that I, I, I'm thinking more about and I'd um, maybe like to talk more about that later. What is happening in the 1970s that on the one hand sees the rise of the environmental movement, um, but, but also uh, the most cavalier regard um, for precaution. Um, so Indira Gandhi, of course, is one of the very uh, few heads of state to attend the first UN conference on the environment uh, in 1972. Um, and her speech continues to be quoted to this day as, as really a very articulate statement um, of the global south position, what remains um, the position um, uh, in, in many climate negotiations, the idea that um, we're not responsible for this, that the fundamental problem is inequality and that concern about the environment should not stop uh, us from being able to enjoy the fruits of development, which the rest of the world already have. And she was very clear in her critique of the colonial origins of this. Many of the advanced countries of today have reached their present affluence by their domination over other races and countries, she said, and through the exploitation 
of their own and others' natural resources. Um, it's a very powerful statement of what we continue to think of as the argument for environmental justice. We do not wish to impoverish the environment any further, she insisted, yet we cannot for a moment forget the grim poverty of large numbers of people. Um, she concluded with a statement that I, I find it worth pausing to reflect upon. She concluded by saying that for the last quarter century, we in India, but more generally across the developing world, have been engaged in an enterprise unparalleled in human history. The provision of basic needs to one sixth of mankind within the span of one or two generations. Back to the Uday Mehta reflection on, on that situation of the middle of the 20th century, the idea that there are no limiting bounds in the scale of this project. This is coming from the top down, and we can argue about how uh, sincere um, the Indira Gandhi government's commitment to environmental protection was. It's clearly a very complicated and contradictory story. They passed the Water Act and the Air Act in the early 1970s, but also uh, oversee um, massive expansion in environmental impact. Um, but perhaps more interestingly, more importantly, the 1970s see the real coalescence of the Indian environmental movement. Rural movements like Chipko, which Ram Guha has written so interestingly in one of the pioneering works of Indian environmental history. Also urban movements coming out of cities like Mumbai are uh, concerned with air and water quality. Large dams, of course, are, are perhaps more than anything else sort of mobilizing force in bringing together these very uh, multiple and diverse coalitions of interests. Uh, the Narmada movement perhaps more than any other in the 19th. 80s. Um, one of the early reports of the Delhi Center for Science Environment, Dying Wisdom, is, is precisely about this sense of what has been lost. What kinds of water management strategies, what kinds of knowledge, what kinds of techniques, uh, what kinds of repertoires of living with an uncertain monsoon have been uh, erased by a technocentric top-down um, uh, approach. And arguably, there's, there's a, more than a, a hint of romanticism in this. Uh, there's a real romanticism of the pre-colonial, which uh, archaeologist Kathleen Morrison sort of wryly remarked that the, the vision of pre-colonial India that you get in, in, in environmental texts like this bears no relation to anything that her evidence uh, tells us. Nevertheless, strategically, as a kind of strategic essentialism, if you like, it's a very interesting introduction of a historical discourse into this debate in the 1970s and 80s, this idea of a kind of pre-colonial ecological balance being disrupted by the twinned force of colonialism and capitalism. And of course, this is something we're still in the field of environmental history uh, grappling with, grappling with understanding exactly how to talk about that transition. Um, so let me move uh, towards a conclusion. Meteorological research has shown that uh, regional drivers of changes in monsoon circulation, chiefly aerosol emissions and land use change, are interacting dangerously with planetary warming to make the monsoon increasingly erratic. The monsoon has been more difficult to model than almost any other part of the global climate system in climate projections, and that is uh, partly because of the feature of the monsoon that attracted its earliest scientists in the 19th century, which is its complexity. In confronting this and the particular kinds of risks that climate change poses to South Asian rivers, Asian rivers, global rivers, we need to draw on the full range of experiences, perhaps, that historical um, research gives us access to. As ever in the present day, the most attention has been given to solutions that are squarely in that late colonial tradition of water engineering. The controversial river linking project, for example, which is currently estimated to be costing about $80 billion. The kind of project which the late Ramaswamy Iyer decried towards the end of his life, having previously been a supporter of large dams, as reflecting an old and discredited uh, Promethean attitude towards nature. The spate of dam building in the Himalayas has met with resistance, but it continues, and that's what I began with. There are a couple of reasons to think that that may nevertheless be changing. One is, is resistance. 
massive protests this this very week um, on the cards against the Suban Sini Dam on the Assam Arunachal border. And it's not the first time that this particular project has been protested. These protests aren't going to go away. And this is one of, of, of multiple sites of mobilization against these constructions and the risks that come with them. A second reason to think that perhaps we, we have reached peak down um, is very different. Um, and that has to do with changing energy balance in India and across the region. And this is from a recent report uh, predicting a, a pretty sharp increase in the importance of solar power, a surprising decline um, perhaps in coal. On one estimate, India will probably need 82% fewer coal power stations than was projected even just a few years ago. This is perhaps fantasy. Uh, we, we must remember in a sense that, that uh, solar power is far from accessible uh, to the poorest because of the technological investment that it takes um, in, 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 in grid or off-grid solar. Um, nevertheless, uh, one thing to notice here, hydropower is nowhere on this graph. Um, so, so despite the sense that the reason why the upper reaches of the Himalayas have been dammed is because of energy hunger, um, it seems that most projections suggest that that is not going to be a significant part of the mix. And at my most optimistic, I, I might, you know, I feel that perhaps um, that might see somewhat of a diminution of these kinds of reckless projects. And yet, remember, you know, we should not adopt an anti-development narrative. Uh, there are ways in which there's something just sticky about the imaginary of large-scale hydraulic engineering. So let me just uh, conclude with just a couple of, of comments. Um, wonderful book by Jed Purdy, After Nature, came out a few years ago, uh, in which he argues that the material world we inhabit is in many ways a memorial to a long-running legacy of contested ideas about nature. But back to the framing of this whole series, environmental, imagining the environment. And the current landscape of, of India's rivers is an outcome of just such a legacy of contested ideas. Colonial responses to an unfamiliar and unpredictable climate in the context of the expansion of agrarian capitalism. Nationalist ideas about securing the Indian people from famine and deprivation. And not least, the ideas and the claims and the demands of hundreds of millions of Indian voters who demand for their communities and their regions the fruits of progress and development. It's also an outcome of vast inequalities, inequalities in access to land, to water, to energy, inequalities in different groups' ability to participate in the decisions that govern their lives and their livelihoods. The scale of the water crises facing most parts of Asia today is, is sobering. But I think the most important lesson that a historical perspective holds, and I think that my anthropologist colleagues could, would only agree with this, is that water management never has been and never will be a purely technical question. Ideas about the distribution and management of water in India and elsewhere are deeply inflected with cultural values and with notions of justice, which is why the River Ryan Rights Project, I think, is so stimulating and important, uh, both in its global scope and in the careful attention to how the law could be made a more effective tool for both ecological and social justice. Thank you very much.